It is good to be here in Yakima. I wish we could all have a better view of this beautiful part of our state, and hopefully very soon we will. I want to thank the representatives that are joining here today. I know you've been raising the flag for a very, very long time about how significant this issue is of wildfires, how important our forest health is and forest management, and also how much your community gets impacted by smoke, uh, even if the fires aren't necessarily right in your area. Um, and I think this is the second time this year I've been out here and seen that how significant that smoke is and how it impacts your quality of life of your community um, and obviously the health. You know, this season has been one of the toughest wildfire seasons in uh, Washington State history, and I think I said that last year. I think I said that in 2018. Um, I'm hoping that this will be maybe the last time I say that, but we are well over 1,700 fires to date this year. We've had over 640,000 acres burn. Um, we have at any point uh, since July 1st had about 12 to 17 uh, significant fires on the landscape with every one of our resources and our federal partners and local fire districts resources being frankly tapped out and too few for the fight that was in front of them. Uh, I come with a little bit of good news because when every morning I look at the fire report and how many fires we have on the landscape and today we have around eight, which uh, is a much better number than we've had for the last two plus months. Um, I also, given sort of the weather conditions that we're seeing, um, we are in a place of being cautiously optimistic. It's nice when we don't have wind. It's nice when we've had some cooler temperatures. We've even had a little bit of moisture. But we did just have a red flag warning just a day or so ago. Um, and I'm also cautiously optimistic because I stood in the same place a year ago where um, we had had about 200 uh, and 20,000 acres burned and we thought it was going to be a really tough year. Um, and we were surprised how we sort of gotten some cooler temperatures and moisture and been able to sort of uh, survive August uh, with some lighter fire season than what was expected and we thought and then Labor Day hit and I don't think anybody will ever forget Labor Day firestorm 2020 um, where 620,000 acres burned literally in 72 hours uh, we saw within just the first 36 you know just the first 36 hours over 70 fires on the landscape uh, we saw one fire, the Cold Spring Fire, burn 100,000 acres in just about five hours. Uh, we lost the life of a little boy as his family tried uh, to outrun that fire, and then we saw the town of Malden burn down. Um, and those images will be seared in my mind forever, frankly. Um, so as we approach the anniversary of the Labor Day firestorm, we are all sort of right now holding our breath and hoping that uh, that is not our reality again this year, especially given we still have a long, uh, a lot of work ahead as we specifically look at Schneider uh, uh, fire. We also look at uh, a number of other fires on the landscape that have been burning for a long time and are likely to keep on burning for a while here before the snow and rainfall. My big push is and plea is frankly to the people of Washington State right now. We're approaching Labor Day. It's a time where people want to get the last blast of summer and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy family as kids are headed back to school. Uh, the reality though is 90% of our fires are caused by humans and we are urging every single person of Washington State to please take all necessary steps and measures to not start these fires in the first place. Um, we are urging them to help align themselves with our firefighters and our communities, like the community of Yakima, that have uh, been facing these fires for many, many months, and the risks that they present to their lives, uh, to their health, to the property. Um, it's our biggest push, and we're hoping that we can get through this Labor Day, and we can get through, um, and everyone is safe, and our communities are safe. Um, I want to recognize our legislators are here. Uh, it's, it's been a long, long fight and push to be able to secure the resources that communities like Yakima need, like this valley needs. Um, one, to have the resources like the air resources where we have now 29 
um, in the state helping. They've been critical on this fire as well as a number of other fires. To have the uh, firefighting resources um, that we will have going forward because we know this problem isn't going to go away anytime soon. And especially uh, the forest health work that is going to help restore the health of over a million acres here in Washington State. Um, in talking with leadership on this fire, it was very clear that forest health work that's already been going on in this area was key to helping provide sort of the ability to limit and reduce the spread of that fire. We need to do a far more amount of that work on the landscape. And then the last piece is community resilience. We know much of the focus on this fire specifically has been trying to prevent um, any loss of life, any loss to property, um, the values at risk, and we know that there are communities throughout the state that are in very high wildfire risk this community being one of them. And now with resources through House Bill 1168, we'll be making some significant uh, progress in helping communities like this become far more resilient to fire. So I want to thank you for your leadership, legislators. I look forward to continuing to work with you. With that, I think I'm going to turn it over to the guy in charge of it all. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Rob Allen. I'm the incident commander for Pacific Northwest Team 2. Uh, we're a, a, an interagency type 1 team. There's 16 of them in the nation. Uh, this happens to be our home area here for a lot of folks on the team also, so it's, it's uh, good to be working here at home. Uh, as far as the, the Snyder Fire and, and, and what uh, the commissioner was talking about, firefighting is a team sport for us. And it really takes everybody to come in. Uh, we've got folks from all over the country. Uh, we've got uh, all the agencies represented from our states to uh, to Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife, uh, everybody's involved. We just found out today that uh, we're going to have a contingent of Canadians showing up here uh, shortly to help pitch in to, uh, to a part of this also. So uh, it really is a team sport and it takes everybody's effort and help. And the local community has been super with support to us also uh, in getting us the things that we need and being able to be helpful uh, as we're moving in and, out and around the community. Uh, as far as the Snyder Fire is going right now, we're, we're looking really good. Uh, we've got a couple more days of the burnout operation that's up on Bethel Ridge, and that's been kind of our key piece to, to get that locked off. Uh, and that keeps the Highway 12 corridor and the 12410Y open uh, and allows us to be able to, to get Rimrock and the, and the river open for recreation activities and other things. So that's been really successful for us. What we'll see going into the next few days as we wrap that up is us returning our efforts back up to the north end, uh, up around the Bumping Lake. Goose Prairie area uh, and starting to work on some of that area as you look at the map, kind of that triangle between the 410 and area where we're up in Gold Creek and um, Cliffdale and those areas to start keeping the fire off of the river and back up in the hills. And that's again uh, where our Canadian resources will end up being probably focused the most uh, and it will be uh, nice to have that extra help. Uh, the competition for resources that we've had so far this year uh, has been uh, trying for all of us. Uh, we had an IC call every morning. Uh, we're the 20 fires that are large fires that are burning in the region right now in Oregon and Washington. We get on and talk about where we are and what some of our, our challenges are and what resources we need. Uh, everybody's been short and having to make uh, strategic decisions on where we can be, be the most successful. So uh, when we get to find areas where we have, like on this, where we found some of those fuel treatments we were just talking about that allow us to be able to get in and and have a place to stand to take care of uh, take care of the fire. It really is a help uh, in bringing all that stuff together. So we'll see that coming across uh, here shortly. One of the big concerns a lot of folks have been asking is about what we're going to do after the fire is over. Uh, and we after we stop the, the initial spread and we start working into that repair mode uh, and trying to fix some of the things that we damaged uh, and being able to replace it. What we're seeing on the fire right now, um, although when you look at our maps, you see a big pink blob. Uh, and the anticipation is that all of that has been destroyed and burned. Uh, when we get out and fly around, you can look at our, our flyby that we have on YouTube. If you look at the Schneider Springs fire, uh, a lot of that country has just had a good understory burn, much like we would have tried to if we were burning it uh, in, in a prescribed fire area. Uh, and that will all help to, to, for future times in this area here as we're looking forward. So um, it's been a, a big effort to get it to the point where we are right now. We should start seeing uh, the, the, the the shrinking of the size of the folks, we have over 800 people working on the fire right now. Um, over the next uh, few days uh, and into next week, you'll start to see that group starting to, to dwindle off as we get those people off 
rested and then off to the next fire, uh, whether that's in the region here or down in Northern California where a lot of our folks are going to also uh, to try to help. So we'll start to shrink our size down here. We'll be working with, uh, with the DNR and with the forest to, to put in a game plan for the team that comes in behind us that will take this into the rest of the year. Uh, but just know that, that that fire, there's areas in the fire, especially out in the William L. Douglas wilderness, that it's just really steep, rugged terrain. Um, and we don't have the firefighting resources uh, to go up in there and try to get that right now. Um, and, and we probably won't because they'll be needed someplace where there's higher values at risk that are being threatened uh, than the wilderness. Uh, so there, you're going to see smoke coming off of this. There'll be places on this fire that are going to burn until we get what we call a season-ending event, uh, which is when we finally get enough uh, rain and snow uh, that'll, that'll take care of the fire for now. Um, we'll still see smoke popping up on it um, all the way through most of the winter uh, until we get some real good moisture on it. Uh, that marine influence that comes in here is going to be helpful, uh, but as we were talking about gaming some of the places that we might try to go and put the fire out if we had all the crews in the world to go after it, some of the places that would just take us so long to get there would probably snow on us before we get the line in anyway. Um, and, and that's definitely a much better uh, uh, deterrent to fire than anything we could put on the ground. So. That's kind of where we are right now and where we're going forward. We'll, we'll be here uh, for another uh, week or two, uh, working on this up, getting up the next organization will be coming in. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're chipping away at, uh, at the key places we need to get to. Thanks. Thanks. I think with that, questions, anyone? Any questions? Shy group, quiet group. I have one. Okay. Um, so what do the conditions look like over this Labor Day weekend compared to last Labor Day weekend? You know, so last Labor Day weekend, let's just sort of set the stage. Last Labor Day weekend, we had a hot, dry terrain, hot, dry landscape. But what was the factor that was the most challenging was the hurricane force winds. Um, those hurricane force winds took, uh, you know, hot, dry landscape, a couple of 56 fire starts in 24 hours, and then spread them rapidly at a pretty fast pace in multiple areas of the state. Um, when we have those kind of hurricane force winds, it grounds our aircraft, and our aircraft this fire season and last fire season have been instrumental on initial attack. I mean, I talked about 1,700 fires to date this year, what you've really heard about is maybe 20. Why? Because our firefighters on the ground and our air resources in the air have been racing after every one of those early fire starts and putting them out quickly, 95% of them within, you know, below 10 acres. Um, now, let's roll forward to this year. Right now, we have an even hotter, drier landscape. The majority of the state is in a drought. It's why we've had um, more significant fires this year. We are not right now predicting those hurricane force winds. Um, and that's our hope. And I say that because right now everything, you know, we have to be cautiously optimistic because <laughs> until we can't be, right? Um, we're hopeful that because we won't have those hurricane force winds, we're not likely to see that. That doesn't mean though we should rest and feel safe because when you look at the number of fires we've had to date this year and how significant in size many of them have become, we don't necessarily need hurricane force winds to cause a challenge. The other thing that I think is important is last year between the July and August time frame, we had some cooler temperatures. Our firefighters weren't fighting fires straight from July 1 to Labor Day. They had a lot of time for some break. Um, we also didn't have the majority of the western states um, in a drought, so we didn't have to compete with um, the exhaustion and fatigue of resources, um, both equipment, aircraft, and firefighters that we have had this year, meaning Washington isn't alone in this challenging season. Um, and having battled these fires for a long, long time, they're tired, they're exhausted. As you pointed out, we have few resources. We've been saying that since really, frankly, the beginning of July, um, and so, we still remain concerned and on high alert, but we are hopeful that we won't have sort of the, the significant tragedies we had last year. But it's gonna rely on every one of person of Washington State not being one of those sparks in the forest and landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Um, what you just said here, the <clears throat> same cautiously optimistic, but with these higher temperatures and all that stuff, how concerned are you that things could be worse this holiday weekend compared to last year? Uh, I would say I remain uh, very, very concerned. Um, I remain very concerned because we were being cautiously optimistic last year as well. You may want to say something can, to this. I can cut the audience a little bit. Yeah, yeah, so I remain very, very concerned. One, I have, we have a lot of men and women who are very, very exhausted and tired. They're already stretched thin fighting the eight fires that are on the landscape right now. Last year at this time, before Labor Day, we had one major fire on the landscape. It was actually in this area. Um, and we had, were able, because we only had one major one on landscape, we had all resources, all hands on deck on that fire, and we were containing it quickly. Um, and then all hell broke loose. And now we didn't have enough resources for all those other fires. Um, we are in a situation where I still have eight significant fires on the landscape. As you heard, we are already too few resources. We're lucky to bring in some resources from Canada, but we're still too few. And so if more fires happen, we're stretched thin. We already have too many fires in the landscape. We're going to be in trouble. I'll let you go ahead and add some more here. <laughs> that one doesn't want to stay. <laughs> uh, the big difference, and we've been talking about this on that call that I talked about that all the ICs get on, and we've been talking about looking at what it looks like as we come up to the anniversary of the 7th when we had uh, those winds. And the big difference now between last year it's just the weather we had the last two weeks. Um, it's been significantly cooler. We've been on kind of this roller coaster where we've had some really nice weather and then we've had a little bit of cloud cover, we've had a little bit of moisture, uh, and we're just not seeing the weather pattern pick up like we would with that big high pressure system moving in and creating those east winds. So we're not seeing the same weather pattern coming up, uh, but we are still challenged with the stuff that we have, and one of the things that we just started to, we're starting to see kind of in the forecast is a potential maybe for a little bit of lightning. So we might get some new starts. Um, one advantage we do have, although there are, uh, we are tired and we have been working from fire to fire to fire, one of the advantages we have right now, and as, as one of the local fire managers here in this area, having the large fires that are in, on the landscape right now in Washington, if we get new starts, we will be chipping in with the local uh, initial attack folks to help out. I already have a big problem right here that you've asked me to manage. Um, I don't need another one. So we'll take resources from what we have here and help out with the local as we get new starts starting and, and we'll be pushing those in and, and all the other fires here up at 25 mile and uh, everything over on the Colville will be doing the same thing. We have initial attack responsibility in part of our area. Uh, but we'll also chip in with the local resources to help keep things smaller. And we've got a lot of assets here that we can provide to that effort. And the, the other thing I'll, I'll just add that's different, I mean, this year we brought in a significant number of more air resources. Last year we were stretched very, very thin and on every level, um, and especially in air resources, even though we couldn't fly in those first sort of 36, 72 hours, we were able to fly after that but there were no air resources to be found. Um, they were already being utilized in California and Oregon, and in those areas, those fires tended to have more values at risk, so we kept losing out. This year, we took uh, measure, we took control, basically, and said, look, we're not gonna be in a place where we're having to beg, borrow, and steal for air resources. We're gonna make sure Washington State has what's needed. We have 29 air resources under our exclusive control right here in Washington State. Um, that will help us uh, also get on those fires quickly if it's a lightning strike for an in initial attack. Yeah. Um, could I get to, I uh, guess, first to kind of talk a little bit about some of the fuel treatments that helped with this fire, either one of you, and I'm uh, curious a little bit about also the slash piles, if they were able to be um, burned before fire season. Why don't you take the sure. ones on the specific, because this as to the strategy that was at play here. Yeah, so one of the things that we, uh, the advantage we had, and you'll see if you look at our map, there's a, a kind of a big hole in the middle, right? Part of that burned into rock. Uh, others of those burned into some fuels treatments that both the forest and DNR and actually the Yakima Nation have worked on. Um, and then in particular, uh, Bethel Ridge was a good place for us to pick where it goes up to the communication tower that's up there, which is the major 911 hub for this area. That had been logged around it, and then there were fuels treatments along that ridge line. So, as the fire burned up into that area um, and we were able to do some, some lighting ourselves, we ended up at one point in uh, yesterday, the day before, we had about 90 little spot fires that came over, but they all came into the treated area. 
So rather than getting back up into the canopy and taking off something we couldn't handle, uh, they stayed where we could put engines on them and we had dozers up there, equipment that could work on those things. So as we've worked our way around the fire, um, you know, every place we've found some spot that we've either, we've done some sort of fuels treatment we've been able to, to get to. Um, and even if we haven't had a chance to burn the piles because we didn't have, uh, the, as we were talking, the prescription, the window uh, to be able to do that um, in the fall or the spring, which is our, our burning times where you describe fire, uh, there's still, just the fact that everything's been cleaned out is, is helpful for us. Um, when we're doing it here on the team, uh, what incident management teams are putting those lines in, all the trim, most of the stuff that we cut and trim, and if you, when you get a chance to get into Bumpy Lake and you drive down that road there, you'll see a lot of wood chips along the side. So all that slash that we end up taking out, we chip as we're going along so it doesn't add to the fuel load. Yes, what is the plan to prescribe fire use this fall? You want that one? <laughs> Mine is to try to get more of it going faster and smoother, right? And I'm we with just, you. <laughs> we, were just, we were just talking about this, you know, and you can jump in, but you know, our biggest challenge has been, you know, we've got, you know, people here are tired of the smoke, right? Look, and when we do prescribed fire, we're having to add on to the smoke they've already been experiencing. We have multiple layers of agencies required for permitting, and, and that means it's a slowdown. It can be very inefficient when we have a very narrow window to get prescribed fire on the landscape. And the longer our season is hotter and drier like this, the less time we have. Our other issue, too, is that the, those same folks that we do in the prescribed, for, fire, the prescribed fire work for us are fighting fires right now. And by the time we get to the end of a season like this, it's like, well, I'd just like to have some time off to be home with my family and do some other things. So we start losing some of our workforce. We still have plans to, to do a lot of prescribed fire. And, and after a season like this, especially given, depending on how the weather works out, as we're looking at the plans that we're making here in the Okanagan Wenatchee, uh, where we're going to go forward, we'll probably end up trying to do a lot more just pile burning this year than we will in our understory or, or, or landscape burning. Uh, but we'll try to get out there and take care of a bunch of those piles because we can, it's easier for us to get a smoke permit to do that uh, and it takes fewer people uh, and we can do a bunch of it after it's already snowed and, and we just like the piles and we keep coming back and take care of them. But um, we do still have a, a, an aggressive uh, prescribed fire plan for this, this fall. Uh, and then we'll pick it up again in the spring. Whether or not we have the folks when it gets to that point here this fall to implement the plan, I don't know yet, but uh, we'll be working on it. And I mean, I think this is where House Bill 1168 is bringing more resources, right? We will have more people trained to be able to do prescribed fire, and we'll also have more firefighters to fight fires. And, you know, at this point, any, any more bodies will definitely help us in progress, both on firefighting and prescribed fire. Yes. Um, as far as anything going on right now, what is the current communication going on with local firefighters with, with your office? Uh, let me, what more do you mean? As far as, the, as, far as in, any kind of preparation for this weekend and beyond. Oh, yeah. I mean, first, we work very closely with our local fire districts. Um, obviously, on the fire, we rely on uh, the ones in our community, but also we bring in fire uh, districts from um, outside of the community to help on those fires. And really, it's a truly close, coordinated team of federal, state, and local uh, agencies fighting these fires, and we would not be effective if we were siloed. Um, we specifically have been working to just get the word out and leverage um, all communication channels and information. I mean, same with our legislators. We've been reaching out to them to provide information to share with the public. So a lot of it is just public information campaign on our social media and others, and as well as this kind of opportunity right here. Yeah. You're good? I'm oh. good for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> So um, how, what has the reaction been like to the vaccination mandate for wildland firefighters? And do you think it will affect uh, firefighting forces once that deadline comes up in October? Yeah, you asked the question about what's different between this year and last year, right? Um, as to Labor Day weekend and fire, uh, I, I was gonna add this on. And I, and I think it's important for people to realize this. Last year, COVID hit and we were all learning how to fight fires at the same time of battling a deadly pandemic and there was no manual on how to do that. We were writing it as we were fighting the fires. Um, last year, our agency only had around three incidents of COVID. Um, uh, two of the incidents were before 
the firefighters had even reported to the fire line and one other one was on his way. Uh, so we really didn't have the challenge around quarantining in a camp. We didn't have the challenge of having to turn firefighters away. I will tell you in the last three to four weeks, we have had more incidents of firefighters testing positive and having to quarantine whole teams within a camp uh, to prevent the spread. Um, in addition to that, we've had to turn uh, fire teams away. So uh, one team of 20 came in and four tested positive. So before they could even get to the fire camp, we had to say, sorry, you need to go back home. Uh, I'm sure it is a pretty hard, challenging thing that we've got firefighters ready to fight. We need more firefighters. And we have to say, no, thank you, you need to go home. It, it has made this fire season, which is already challenging, even more challenging. Uh, so we took significant steps to do two things. One, we are bringing um, to each one of the fire camps vaccination um, so that it is easier for our firefighters to get vaccinated, uh, given they're already um, working 16 plus hour days. Um, in addition, obviously, we've uh, put in place now a mandate that all um, of our firefighters will be vaccinated, and we've urged um, our partners, U.S. Forest Service and Interior, to do the same. Um, frankly, we're just trying to keep them alive, not only protect them from fires, but also protect them from COVID, and we're also trying to protect those that are interacting with them. Yes? Follow up on that. How many teams have you had to turn away and you have numbers on positive um, tests for firefighters this year? So I don't have the number right now of that we've had to turn away and, and some of these fire, some of the camps aren't DNR sure. uh, managed with camps. They're, they could be uh, Forest Service and others. Um, we have to date, and I haven't gotten the latest count in the last few days, but had over 50 um, and that may cross agencies. Um, and I think that was from last week. We can get a, a newer number for you as well as the information we have on and on those we've had to turn away. Yeah, do you have a question? Yes. Okay. Oh. When you do have the vaccine now, and last year you didn't, why do you think this year you're seeing so many more cases when we're, you know, when we have this, this way to be able to fight it now that we didn't have last year? You're asking the same question where I was like asking ours. Last year we had no vaccine. We clearly put immediate safety precautions in place. Although many of our firefighters can't wear masks on the fire line because obviously it's not safe. So um, we put in the precautions within camp. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I what everything I've heard is that the Delta uh, virus is far more transmittable um, and uh, it has created more challenges even with the vaccine in place. Yes. When will DNR land be reopened after the fire season? Uh, so we're basically, right now our goal, first, we hate closing our public lands. Our public lands are here for the public to enjoy. Uh, and especially in the time when the sun is out, the skies are blue, and it's not raining or snowing on us. Um, we also know how important they are, you know, especially given COVID, where more and more people are flocking to our public lands for their mental, physical, and emotional health and well-being so it's a very difficult thing to close those lands and the, um, we are right now assessing it uh, literally on a weekly basis of you know and it's largely going to be dependent on weather conditions um, as it continues to be hot and dry uh, with very little moisture this landscape with each week just gets more parched and gets is still prime fuel for a lightning strike or as we know, 90% of our fires are caused by humans for anybody to be out there doing something that isn't smart. Um, so we're going to be assessing based on the weather conditions to make sure that landscape isn't one where a spark will lead to a fire like we have here. Did you have a question? Um, well, I was just going to kind of look forward to next year. I know we've got a ways this I'd year. I'd love to look forward to next year. <laughs> Um, I'll have at least part of 1168 next year. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> that, that was, that was going to be my question, actually, with 1168. Um, I know that the funding wasn't able to really get here for this fire season. How might it help next year um, beyond the, the aerial support that we've been able to secure uh, this season? Right, so yes, we'll have more air resources available, uh, which will be key. 
Uh, in addition to that, we will have more firefighters. So we'll have 100 more firefighters. Um, when they're not fighting those fires, they'll be doing fuels treatment. Um, we are already getting up and going to hiring those firefighters and training them as soon as this season is over. Um, every one of them will help give a break uh, to the firefighters that have been doing double duty um, and we'll be able to make sure we have the resources. I think the two other components which shouldn't be missed is one, fuels treatment, fuels treatment, fuels treatment, fuels treatment, fuels treatment. I think I got that in and under, right? Uh, he, you know, he already spoke to the context that Fuels treatment not only helps that forest be able to reduce the fires and the damage to the forest, but it also becomes a wildfire strategy. Um, and the more fuels treatment we can get on federal and state and private lands and tribal lands, the more these fires will be smaller and, and not as significant as what we've seen this year. Um, in addition to that is going to be community resilience. Uh, you know, we've had more evacuations this year than any of the years that I've been in this position. Uh, we have been lucky again not to have significant number of structures lost, uh, you know, although we're not out of the woods yet. Um, and a big part of the legislation we worked on with the legislature has a community resilience piece that will help communities like this become more resilient to fire, doing the work to create that defensible space around their home, to make their neighborhoods, uh, to create more fuel breaks around communities uh, that will help fight the fires and also protect the structures. Anything else? Yes? So you keep coming here year after year. I'd like to come here to drink more wine and eat more fruit <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy the beautiful nature. So, but yes, I, I do keep coming here. So. Is it? Is it? Um, I am assuming it's really frustrating to have to keep coming to tell people not to start fires and to take care of things. What? What would you tell people about? You know this problem because it's been ongoing for years and it just keeps getting worse yeah i mean the last two years alone majority of our fires that are human caused have largely been debris pile or miscellaneous and that miscellaneous is where you know activities are happening out in the landscape that aren't smart um you know I, my biggest message is is that it's probably twofold one is i think there's a, in situations like this when a community is being told they, they must be prepared to evacuate or they need to evacuate. Um, and when their last few weeks of summer are being um, challenged by the air quality that is here, that many people feel like they're helpless to these catastrophic fires. There's nothing they can do. It is out of their control. They're powerless. And the reality is they're not. Um, if every single person in Washington State, I, I always say if they could become part of our fire team. Uh, they don't have to get out there with the Pulaski's. They don't have to work 18 hour days and heat and smoke trying to put those fires out and dig line. Uh, they don't have to sleep in those camps. I know they look really pleasant. They don't have to sleep in those camps and eat the delicious food. Um, all they have to do is make sure they don't start the fire in the first place. We need more of the people of Washington owning this problem, not just the legislature, not just our firefighters and our pilots, and, and not just Department of Natural Resources and U.S. Forest Service and our local fire districts. We need them owning this problem and seeing their role in it. Not only their role of causing the fires, but also up front their role of preventing them. And I'd say that's the most significant thing. You know, across the state, across the West Coast, we have people pouring their hearts out, their prayers for our firefighters. Um, every single day I get up during fire season and just pray that we don't lose one of our own. Uh, we just lost a fire chief 30-some uh, years in the service just earlier this week as he responded to his fourth wildfire that day. Um, we all pour our hearts out in our prayers for those firefighters, and I don't think, and I, I think it's important that the public realizes that prayers are critical and important, but also action by each and every one of them is important. Uh, and hopefully if people can make this Labor Day the safest Labor Day possible uh, for their families, um, 
they can make it the safest Labor Day possible for our firefighters, and that's what we're urging the public to do.